Hello and welcome to the sixth video lecture of ICJ's course on litigation before the UN treaty bodies. Today we will look more closely at the structure of the complaint and the type of information or evidence that you should submit to the treaty body to support the complaint and substantiate any allegations. This relates closely to video 3 where we examined the different stages of a complaint before the treaty bodies. So if you have not seen that video yet, I would advise you to also watch that video. The committees will decide complaints based on information submitted to it. And so it is fundamentally important to provide the relevant committee with all information you can collect in support of your complaint. This means to comprehensively document not only each and every alleged violation, but also the exhaustion of domestic remedies, an important admissibility requirement as we saw in video 5. It can also help to provide such documentation in support of the remedies you are requesting from the committee, as we shall see. A brief word about the burden of proof when submitting a complaint to the treaty bodies. Irrespective of whether or not you are using the standardized complaint form mentioned in video 3, you will need to substantiate the allegations with relevant information. This is important to make sure that the complaint is admissible but also for the treaty body to be able to decide whether a violation was committed. In assessing the information submitted, the Human Rights Committee, for instance, made clear that the burden of proof cannot rest only on the complainant. So the committee will consider any state response to your allegations, but they will also take into account the state's failure to respond to such allegations and any challenges you or your client may have experienced in accessing certain information. This is because, in many instances, the complainant and the state will not have equal access to the evidence and the state may hold information such as official papers from state authorities like arrest logs, detention records or even medical reports. And where you have submitted credible evidence about alleged violations and where further clarification depends on information that is in the hands of the state, the committee may consider that the allegations are substantiated in the absence of a satisfactory explanation by the state party. So in the absence of any explanation from the state, where the state for instance failed to respond, the committee will give due weight to the complainant's submission. For example, where you can show that your client suffered injuries in detention that they did not suffer from prior to being detained, the burden of proof shifts to the state with the state having to explain how the injuries occurred. In the absence of such explanations, the committee may find that the injuries constitute evidence of a violation of the prohibition of torture and ill treatment. We have mentioned before that you should submit your complaint and all accompanying information and evidence in one of the working languages of the Secretariat of the Treaty Body, which are English, French, Spanish and Russian. This also means that you should translate all documents you are submitting in support of your complaint and which are not available in one of these languages, at least in summary form where those documents are very long. It is not necessary to translate entire reports, for example, from the UN, but sufficient to provide a summary translation or translation of the relevant sections of the report. Now let's turn to the structure and documentation needed. As you will recall, there are various stages of the complaint process before the treaty bodies which the complaint must include, with the key ones being admissibility of the complaint, the merits of the allegations and the request for remedies. Each should be supported with relevant information and evidence. There are different approaches as to how to structure the section on admissibility. Most admissibility requirements, as also explained in video 3, are relatively straightforward to address. However, it is important to show in fact that you have not submitted the complaint anonymously, substantiated the alle alleged violations of the relevant treaty and that you have not submitted the complaint to another procedure, where you or someone else with the victim's consent has submitted the complaint to another procedure of international settlement, you will need to explain this and show how the complaint you are submitting is different and should be declared admissible. The main challenge will be to address the requirement to exhaust domestic remedies. Depending on the facts of the case, you could start by explaining whether domestic remedies have been exhausted and then proceed to explain how, setting out that there is no further remedy to exhaust, which is why you are submitting the case to the committee. 
where remedies were not exhausted, explain that the complainant did not exhaust domestic remedies and refer to the standard jurisprudence of the committees that only effective and available remedies with a reasonable prospect of success need to be exhausted. You can then set out how, in your case, no such remedies were available to the complainant in the state party. Documentation you may want to use to support this include the testimony of the complainant. So when taking the complainant's testimony, it is important to ask them about any steps they may have taken to seek redress domestically and reasons why they have not taken any steps where that was the case. You would then refer to this in the admissibility section. You would also submit copies of any complaint filed and any responses received. Where you have not received a response, clearly explain this in the support of your argument that no effective remedies are available. Any court decision or judgment to show that you have exhausted or attempted to exhaust domestic remedies or to show shortcomings of the relevant decision. You may want to submit information on laws, regulation or rules of procedure applicable in the state party as well as relevant jurisprudence to show that you have exhausted all domestic remedies or to show that domestic remedies are actually not effective or not available. For example, you could show that treaties have not been incorporated or only insufficiently or that procedures are unduly expensive and therefore not available. You could also provide information to show that authorities knew or should have known about the alleged violations, such as media articles, reports by the UN, communications from the UN special procedures, and that they failed to react to this. Reports from the UN and others providing context on the functioning of the justice system, including concluding observations from the treaty bodies, can also be submitted. In the past, we have also submitted the fact that a complainant received asylum abroad due to a recognition that they face persecution in the state party to illustrate that it would be too dangerous for the victim to attempt to exhaust domestic remedies. Now let's move on to the merits. After the section on exhaustion of domestic remedies, you can turn to the merits of the case explaining which violations have been committed. The standardized complaint form does not give you a lot of room to set out the violations, providing for only 600 words to explain that the facts described constitute violations of the victim's rights. And to specify, by identifying the articles under the relevant treaty, which rights have been violated. If you do not use the form, it is still advisable to identify very clearly which articles in the relevant treaty you allege have been violated. In cases involving several violations, it might be strategic to focus just on specific violations in significant detail rather than invoking all violations, subject, of course, to what you discussed with the victim. A possible structure for drafting the section on alleged violations of the treaty could be to start by stating that the state's authorities' conduct in question amount to a violation of, for example, Article 7 ICCPR. And then you may want to briefly set out the law for example, by providing a brief reference to relevant jurisprudence of how Article 7 is interpreted, including in contexts similar to your own case. So, if the victim you are representing suffered torture and ill-treatment in detention, it would be helpful to refer to jurisprudence where the treaty body found that an individual's treatment in detention amounted to torture and ill-treatment in violation of Article 7. It is also common for the treaty bodies to look at jurisprudence of other mechanisms in courts, so you may also refer to cases decided by regional bodies, such as the African Commission or Inter-American Court of Human Rights. After setting out the law, you apply it to the facts of the case and show how the conduct in question amounted to a violation in line with the jurisprudence you have referenced. So to stay with the alleged violation of Article 7, it is best to provide details on the treatment inflicted rather than just state that the victim has been tortured or ill-treated. You could refer to the methods or instruments used to inflict the treatment, the period of time over which the treatment was inflicted and the overall circumstances to show that the treatment was inflicted deliberately and caused severe pain and suffering with a specific purpose and by or at the instigation or with the acquiescence of state officials where, for example, the treatment was inflicted by a non-state actor, 
you would additionally show how the state has failed in its obligation to prevent and protect against the treatment from happening. Documentation you may want to use and refer to in order to substantiate the alleged violations can include, again, the testimony of the complainant. Remember that the testimony must be sufficiently detailed to answer questions about what happened, about the victim, the perpetrators, the type of violations, the locations where the violations took place and how they were committed. You may want to follow a chronological order to describe the facts. It is important to be consistent and to clarify any inconsistencies where they might, might exist. So for instance, you may allege in the initial submission that an event occurred on a specific date. The state party might be able to show in their submission that it actually occurred on a different date. You would then want to acknowledge and, if you can, explain the inconsistency. It is also important to ask the client about how they experienced the violations and the treatment inflicted. In cases of torture and ill treatment, you'll need to show that the treatment reached a certain level of severity. Referencing the victim's testimony in which they describe what they felt and how they reacted to treatment can help you to show that the treatment in question caused indeed severe pain. A medical legal report documenting injuries can also help in this respect. This can be physical injuries as well as psychological harm documented by a specialized and trained medical doctor or psychologist, ideally in accordance with international standards such as those included in the Istanbul Protocol, a manual on the documentation of torture and ill treatment. However, it's important to emphasize it's not absolutely mandatory that such a report is prepared or submitted and complaints can be submitted to treaty bodies without medical legal reports documenting violations. Contextual information in the form of UN, NGO and other reports showing that violations similar to those you allege are a common occurrence in the state party are also good to submit. For example, it can help to also refer to findings of the UN and others that conditions in detention in a particular prison amount to ill treatment, or that a specific law enforcement unit is notorious for inflicting torture and other ill treatment on detainees. This can corroborate the client's allegations. Official documentation where you have it, such as police reports, arrest warrants or detention logs. These are some of the pieces of evidence you may want to use. This is optional and there is no requirement for a specific piece of evidence. If you do not have a medical legal report or a forensic report or a detention or arrest uh, log, then that is not in and of itself a problem. Where possible, you can also explain the absence of certain pieces of evidence. For example, it may simply be the case that a victim did not have access to a doctor who could have adequately recorded the injury suffered also because no adequately trained doctors or psychologists exist in the country at the time the violation was committed. Witness testimonies may not be available in many cases, for example, because violations are being committed in secret or because witnesses might be too afraid to testify. The authorities in the state party may not have provided copies of relevant official documentation, such as arrest warrants or detention logs, in which case you can explain that to the relevant treaty bodies. Once you have drafted the section on the violations allegedly committed, you should set out the remedies requested by the victim. If you use the committee's complaint form, there is not much room to do so. However, once your complaint is registered, the committee will usually ask you if you want to provide information on the remedies requested in more detail. And so this would then be an opportunity to do so. Irrespective of whether you use the form or draft your complaint without using the form, it is crucial for any complaint to the treaty bodies to set out what you request in terms of remedies. This is not only because your client has a right to and may need such remedies, but also because this is where you may want to set out the strategic element of your litigation, the remedies going beyond the individual case. We'll look at this more closely in the next video, but it helps to be as precise as possible in this section and to clearly identify what remedies you require and why. Where a committee found that a state party is responsible for a violation, they often have a tendency to be rather brief and general about the remedies they request the state to implement. 
This is also because in many cases the complainants did not sufficiently detail the remedies required. So you may want to use the testimony of the complainant to explain why they need, for example, compensation or that they need specific forms of rehabilitation to address specific medical and psychological harm suffered. They may require certain measures of restitution, such as being freed from detention, or they want an apology from the state and official recognition that what has happened to them was wrong. The complainant's testimony, therefore, should ideally also include information about the harm suffered, the impact the violations had on the client's physical and psychological well-being, and their social economic situation. Where we are dealing with a particularly serious violation that led to the client's life being interrupted or forever changed, it can help to understand what the client wanted their life to be like and how what happened prevented them from pursuing their life plan. If you have it, it also helps to have a medical legal report to show the harm suffered and to claim the types of reparation accordingly. So for example, specific measures of rehabilitation required or compensation for medical expenses. In addition to individual measures of reparation, you could then ask the committee to request certain measures to guarantee non-repetition of the violation. And to make sure that these are precise, you may want to submit information on specific shortcomings in the state party's legal and institutional frameworks that you identify as being the root causes of the violations. You can identify specific pieces of legislation or even articles within the legislation that are problematic or fall short of international standards and that require reform. You can also suggest that a specific law enforcement unit should receive training on the use of force and applicable human rights standards. This brings me to the end of video number six. We'll look more closely at remedies and reparation in the next video and I hope to see you there.